Hi, everyone. Our next speaker holds several positions here at UT Southwestern, including Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Program in Ethics in Science and Medicine. Throughout his career, he has applied his passion for ethics to his practice as a physician, specifically by looking at issues in psychiatry through the lens of philosophy. He has authored and co-authored two books on this topic, has received several awards for his work, including the Psychiatric Award for Excellence by the Texas Society of Psychiatric Physicians, and is co-founder of an international organization dedicated to looking at issues at the interface of philosophy and psychiatry. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Sadler. Uh, thanks, Rima, uh, for that kind introduction. You know, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with such august uh, company. Uh, I have to confess that my most ambitious climb uh, so far has been 10 flights of stairs at Parkland. <laughs> um, and the closest until today I've ever uh, got to a Nobel Prize was bumping into Mike Brown at the faculty club. <laughs> Regardless, it's an honor, and I would like to actually go back in time and talk a little bit about my first day, my first clerkship, and my first patient you know, walk-arounds uh, uh, at my medical school. The events I'm about to depict did not uh, occur here at Southwestern, for reasons you'll see uh, perhaps why. Uh, we were leaving to see our patients, uh, and my uh, resident happened to be the chief resident on this service, and his opening direction was, let's go see the swill. Now, for those of you who don't know what swill is, it's a blend of food trash and water that's fed to pigs. This obviously was made a big impact on me about what medicine shouldn't be and what professional conduct should not be. The second event uh, of a similar sort of discouragement uh, occurred later in another clerkship rotation, again at another institution, and we had some down times and we were talking about our dreams, the fellow students with our attending. And uh, I uh, uh, offered that one of my dreams was to apply the methods of philosophy to clinical or conceptual problems in medicine and ultimately psychiatry is where I ended up. Uh, my attending at the time responded, that won't last. Well, it turned out that it did last. And these two sort of negative lessons were inspiring to me uh, that first of all, there has to be a better way of doing medical education if this is the sort of role modeling we're being experienced to. And it really inspired the kind of persistence that Dr. Palmer uh, described so well in his presentation. So I'm going to focus not so much on the medical education end of my career, but also, but more on the ethics and philosophy of medicine end. So what happened with my career was a whole bunch of stuff that I can't review here very well. Um, Dr. Palmer talked about the idea of others, and building uh, collegial networks as others, with others is crucial. Uh, we founded some, uh, a national organization and an international organization to really establish what amounts to a new discipline. Uh, we needed outlets for uh, publications of our scholarship. We developed this journal, Philosophy, Psychiatry, and Psychology, that I have the honor of co-editing, and ultimately developed a, a book series with the Oxford University Press called International Perspectives in Philosophy of Psychiatry. Right now, we're in the midst of planning our 50th volume. This, we started in 2003. This has been an extraordinary success. These books actually make money, believe it or not. Um, but I'd like to turn, though, to my actual personal work and share some of the uh, crucial ideas that were important to me and then how they spun out into uh, uh, casting light on some of the conceptual issues in psychiatry in my case. The first is I'd like to pay tribute to uh, a colleague and friend of many years now, uh, KWM or Bill Fulford. He's a, a philosopher and psychiatrist in the UK and Bill uh, introduced me to the philosophy of David Hume. Some of you philosophy students are quite familiar with this. 
David Hume was a, a moral philosopher, Scottish, and uh, basically made a famous quote that now appears in virtually every uh, significant philosophy textbook. And the famous quote is, no ought from an is. And what this term or expression means is, is that just a collection of facts in and of itself doesn't give us any direction or guidance about what we should do in an in a ethical or even a practical sense. So facts don't yield value or prescribe actions. So for example, if we look at this background, this is a cloudy sky, obviously. But to say the, is, the sky is cloudy, that is a fact. But it doesn't really give us any direction about whether this, uh, a cloudy sky is good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, Bill had his own professor and influence, R.M. Hare, another uh, Oxford moral philosopher, who was interested in, how, in the logical properties of how uh, value words, terms, value terms, language, uh, operated. And Hare thought that, that certain terms could be called value terms. And I give you the really obvious examples. We call these thin value terms today because if you try to extract the meaning, the evaluation from these words, you're left with nothing. There's nothing left in terms of their meaning. But things aren't so simple. Uh, Hare also noted that lots of words, in fact, probably the, uh, the most of our adjectives that we use uh, combine facts and values in their meaning. And so if we take a word like clarity, uh, clarity has a fact component pertaining to perception or understanding, as well as a value component, which is, for example, simplicity, lucidity, and ease of recognition. We can't extract either component without losing the sense or the meaning of what the word clarity means. So this theory, this philosophy, uh, was very exciting to me because what that meant was is that we could uh, identify, if we could identify value terms in a rigorous, systematic, logical way, we could excavate values in just about any kind of discourse, speech or writing, and be kind, a kind of philosophical anthropologist. We could excavate the moral, the ethical, the practical values in just about any kind of human talk. And we could even understand and identify scientific values that drive theory and method. So the, my challenge then was, how do we identify uh, these value terms in, a, in this rigorous way that I had uh, dreamed of? And it turns out the Harvard logician, Hilary Putnam, and the Australian philosopher, John McKee, converged on this idea and definition of values that turned out to be very uh, useful. They said that ideas, uh, the values are ideas or dispositions which are action guiding and subject to praise or blame. So that if, if something, uh, if it's, the sky is cloudy, that, that doesn't give us any particular direction. And by saying the sky, the sky is cloudy, it doesn't uh, subject the, the utterer to praise or blame. So this goes back to mere facts don't, do, uh, don't, don't operate this way. And again, to Hume's motto, no ought from an is. So this was really my solution to excavating values in discourses. We could use this definition to find value terms and understand the implicit value structures of any kind of talk. So this could be applied to all these areas from medical textbooks to medical students' case write-ups, uh, and anything else in between. So why is this important? Well, what's important is, is it gives us a method for opening up these uh, varieties of values so that we can analyze, discuss, negotiate, and change them. We can also know when we're sort of being manipulated uh, by rhetoric and the like. This helps us to not overlook values, not naively uh, presuppose them, but rather uh, understand them in this rich sense. So I'd like to spend my remaining three and a half minutes in cashing out this to clinical problems. The first example I'd like to do is the uh, uh, official diagnostic manual in psychiatry from the American Psychiatric Association called the DSM for short. 
And this is occupied, my interest in the values involved in the diagnosis of mental illness has occupied me for 20 years now. And I was interested in what the relevance is as well as what they are. And in my 2005 book, Values in Psychiatric Diagnosis, I basically systematically lay out two aspects of values in psychiatry. One is how uh, particular categories present uh, value judgments in psychiatric diagnosis, and also the values involved in developing a diagnostic manual from the people who work together, the committees that put this together. I can give you a brief sample. So here's a bit of text, the introduction to the DSM-IV, that talks about how they uh, have put together and what principles were involved in designing the DSM. If we, again, use this values analytic rubric that I've described to you, and put them in red, we then see a very rich set of values that are involved that are uh, now open to discussion about whether this is the way we really want to do things. So if we extend this then to looking at the diagnostic criteria of psychiatric illnesses, we have this example, conduct disorder. This has turned out to be bigger than I, I expected, so you can actually read it. So what we have here, the DSM basically has these lists of descriptions that patients have to meet in order to qualify for a diagnosis. This particular condition involves uh, children and adolescents involved in various kinds of misbehavior. If you do the values analysis and look at the terms here, we're going to see all kinds of them. In fact, in every criterion item having to do with all kinds of antisocial, negative, criminal, or immoral conduct. Uh, destroying property, lying, stealing, running away, truancy, fighting, etc. So this has inspired sort of my second example, which is my current project I'm hoping to finish up this year, which is, again, surveying psychiatric diagnosis for vice concepts. That is, value judgments and involved criminal or immoral conduct. And conduct disorder, of course, is a very excellent example of a vice-laden diagnosis. The question that I raise is, is this uh, our vice-laden category something we want? My last example has to do <coughs> excuse me, with our, our Southwestern colleges, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Uh, all of our third-year students are expected to create a reflective essay for each of their clerkships that reflects some a professional or ethical concern that they have. It could be positive or it could be negative. Uh, our research group is, is in the midst of analyzing these reflective essays to see about what uh, worries or concerns third-year medical students. And so we're in the midst of this. Uh, so we use qualitative coding software to count these sort of ethical themes that we've identified using these value analytic techniques. And I wanted to give you a brief example. I'm not going to read. Uh, but these are rich personal narratives that the students write. This is about a, a, a third-year student who encounters a young child with cancer who's about to get a, 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 a bone marrow biopsy uh, for diagnosis. And um, the yellow suggests the only sort of value expression that's made, although it's a pretty significant one, and really sort of points toward this particular patient's sort of exquisite cuteness. But the, stu uh, the, the, the student uh, was concerned about this, this kid's crying and offered the reassurance that everything will be all right. But this was a serious cancer diagnosis, and the student ended up writing about how he or she was troubled by false promises, that she felt that she was uh, reassuring this kid falsely and was wondering about the impact of this on this, the uh, student that, on the, on the patient, the doctor-patient relationship, and the like. So we see these various sorts of value terms here, but oftentimes uh, values appear not as words, but as it expressions of sentiment, like in the prior paragraph about, uh, about I wanted to hug him. That concludes what I wanted to say today. Uh, I was smiling at Dr. Palmer's uh, uh, lessons because many of them are the same that I've offered to you all today. Uh, the keys to success are not big news. Uh, good ideas, resolve, persistent, and colleagues and network 
uh, really can make the difference for you. Thank you for your attention and best of luck with your careers.